Good morning, everyone. Um, it was really great to be with many of you in person in Copenhagen a couple of weeks ago, and I'm so sorry I wasn't able to give this presentation at the time. Just to reintroduce myself, uh, Natalie Turner, Deputy Director for Localities at the Centre for Aging Better. The Centre is a charitable foundation or non-profit organisation funded by our National Lottery Communities Fund. We're pioneering ways for ageing to be better for everyone. And we have several programmes of work, uh, one on homes, one on employment, but also on building an age-friendly movement, which is about tackling ageism, but also about um, building an age-friendly movement. As part of that, we support the UK network of age-friendly communities, and we're one of only two non-profits which play that secretariat or affiliate role to um, support national networks. Prior to my time at the Center for Aging Better, I worked in the USA in, um, at AARP, supporting the US network of age-friendly communities from when it started um, to it grown now to um, over 500 communities across the states. Before I go on, I do also want to thank my team, my brilliant team, and also other members of the network for sharing their learning and their wisdom um, in this presentation. Um, there is no such thing as theft in this age-friendly movement. So I hope that you will learn from each other, continue to learn from each other and learn from these slides. Just for a bit more context, in the UK, there are currently 70 age-friendly communities. There is also a national network in Wales um, and that is because the UK is made up of four devolved nations. It makes sense for us to have an approach that therefore suits the different governance in each place. We have all communi communities of all sizes and shapes from city regions like London with a population of over 8 million to smaller towns and rural counties uh, where there are only a few thousand, not quite as small as Anna Barrett's where there's a town with three or 400 um, in the network, but it shows really how this framework can be adapted um, for different size places. We use the term community to cover all of that. So while we others talk about cities, we talk about communities, meaning every kind of place. Okay then, so I've been asked to talk to you about what we need to build an age-friendly city. And I'm going to try and give you a mix of the core building blocks, along with some of the tips that I've learnt along the way. So I'm going to share a couple of examples for the UK and speak for about 20 minutes. Um, some of these examples you might have heard already, but I'll repeat them. Hopefully they'll bear repeating. Um, and also, although I'm not there in person to take questions, I'd like to maybe um, uh, invite you to email or to send any comments and I'm really happy to chat more. We're also really willing if you make it over to the UK, it'd be really lovely for you to come visit and we can chat to you in person or put you in contact with one of our communities to learn from them. So let's remove my video from um, this presentation now. You don't need to watch me all the way through. Okay, so what is an age-friendly community? Always good to start with our definition, and this is the one we have in the UK. An age-friendly community for us is a place that enables you to age well and to live well when you're old, where it's possible for people to continue to stay in their homes, participate in the activities that they value, and contribute to community life for as long as possible. But those two emphasis on age well and live well are important. It's about aging, not just about being older. An age-friendly community should promote the behaviors that help us to stay healthy and active for longer, but also reduce the barriers to do things if or when our abilities decline. So those two concepts are really important to always bear in mind with age-friendly communities. There 
it means people recognising that sometimes older people need more help. So, for example, uh, even without me asking, sometimes the bus driver, when I get off the bus, will lower the, the bus for me so it's easier to get off. They don't all do it, but it's lovely when they recognise that I might need a bit of help with that. Age friendly is something that where you go out in the, into the community and things are accessible uh, for the elderly people, um, like uh, pavements and that, footpaths, uh, bus stops where there's a seat for people to sit, um, being able to get a medication to the door without having to, to, to go to the chemist, that sort of thing. Age friendly means being accepted, but I can't see any difference whether it should be a youth friendly or middle age friendly. We, sh we should all be working together as a community, the teamwork and, and working together. And I think communities and organisations need different aged people and get different views and all working together. I think to age wealth, in, from my perspective, is to be mobile. That's my biggest thing at the moment. So just to be able to participate in activities. I wish I could tell my younger self to keep up with the yoga. And I would say to everybody, keep your mobility. <laughs> and, you know, there must be 50,000 old folk in Salford that could do with the, the, the thing that I, I've been fortunate to have had that interest the uh, Zoom meetings with Andrea and Vanda. <coughs> um, but I'd like other people to, to know about that. But and I spoke to friends of mine in the community and they're not confident enough to come on. It's having that confidence, they're just stuck in the house and oh, I don't think it's for me or it's for old folk. So a core part of the age friendly approach is to listen to the testimony of older people. So that's why I wanted to play the video of that group of older people, because it translating what age friendly means to them is also really important. I'm now going to give you a quick introduction to the WHO's age friendly framework. So there are two elements that combined make up the framework and both act as a guide and a template to follow. And they really hold your hand and they will be your friend throughout the journey of building an age-friendly cities. When we talk about what it takes to build an age-friendly city, it really is about kind of going back to the bund uh, those fundamentals. We call them the what over on the left and the how on the right. The left is the what in terms of we also call it the eight domains. It's this kind of what services, policies and practice you need to consider. On the right is the programme cycle, the how. How will you bring people together and develop your plan to decide what it is that you're going to do? So it's about both the things that you will do, but how you will get the process of deciding on those things and making them happen, turn them into a reality instead of just a list of things. So let's take a look at the domains, the what. The eight domains cover eight aspects of community life that are important to ageing well in a city or community. They were developed with older people and stakeholders across the, the world and so are relevant to a range of cultures and settings, not just cities. By paying attention to the needs and perspectives of older people in each of these domains, that can mean the difference between older age becoming a barrier or not in your community. Now, all these domains overlap and interlink, but broadly they cover the built and the social environment. And the reason is that both of these things matter. For example, it's not just about whether you can physically access the town centre or the community building, but also about whether the activities happening inside that building are welcoming and inclusive, or you have the confidence to take part, or the information you need to find out that it's happening. So those are the eight domains, but how do you get there? How do you decide where to start, who to involve? Now, this is where the programme cycle really comes in. And for those of you who kind of have got your head around the eight domains, 
this will be a sort of steps that will guide and take you through the process of developing your plan and creating the changes that you need to see. Typically, this whole process is about five years, or it can be less. Becoming a more age-friendly community is a journey, and you'll be going at your own pace, depending on your resources and your starting, and starting point. But largely, you will start through the top left and move your way around. As I often say to people, this is not a linear process. You may start in different places. Okay, let's follow this cycle clockwise. The first step is called engage and understand. It's about starting to identify and involve the key stakeholders and older people in your place and bringing them together to understand and to assess really the current age friendliness of your place, where you're starting from. Through this, you get to understand local needs, preferences, priorities, and opportunities for healthy and active aging. So this process can feel prescriptive, but essentially this is about asking, where are we? Who's on board with us? And where can we get more help? It's at this stage that you'll likely form a steering group or committee to oversee your work. And you'll start to involve people in lots of different ways, maybe through public meetings and events, maybe through conducting surveys, focus groups, You'll need to involve a range of local services such as libraries or leisure centres and also the range of departments and organisations so that you can meet as many residents as you can, encourage them to give their views and views that cover those eight domains. When we talked about housing and transport, um, social participation, bringing departments and people together that have an interest in that. A key to this step is also to gain local political commitment, a core part of the WHO approach, which is both bottom up and top down. So this is your starting point. Um, it's usually your starting point. In reality, sometimes you might start with a strategy that is further along. However, if this was where you start, and certainly you should go back to it, it's where you really understand where you are and you begin to build and widen your engagement and understanding throughout the process. So this second stage, plan strategically, is where you bring the people you have started to talk to together to develop a shared vision for your place. If you've built those relationships and you understand your city, where you're starting from and where the preferences and priorities are, you can now start to actually set goals and decide what you want to do. You also start to plan where responsibilities lie for each of the different area and, cru and crucially, where the resources might come from. Part of this stage is to understand how your work aligns with other plans and strategies, because your work does not take place in a vacuum. You will have other cities' plans and priorities around transport, around housing, They're where you want to really apply an age-friendly lens. By doing that, you'll make your work relevant to what other people are doing, but also you can attract resources. It's also the point at which you might start to build a vision, like something um, where you people can get behind, an idea for your movement and uh, maybe a slogan, um, maybe a document, a key document that people will recognize as being age friendly and very easy to explain it. So this stage of the cycle is the bulk of your work act and implement. It's where you will create and deliver on an action plan. Now the size, scale, extent of your action plan will depend on your city's priorities and resources and it can be as big or as small as you can manage. What's important at this stage is making sure that your plans are visible and embedded locally. Age-friendly work shouldn't be a series of standalone projects. You ideally want to make sure there's ongoing reporting and accountability that sits within your city's governance. It's this third stage is also where you would have already been starting to demonstrate impact and building more tangible, tangible examples. People will be getting involved in projects, not just in planning, and through getting involved in things, you can widen your support and also show evidence of impact, particularly to people who may have put time into you early on, um, older people, 
and you want to show it, for example, and you want to show the results of that through this process. The final stage is, monitor, is evaluate. Um, it was sort of a monitoring and evaluating stage, but of course monitoring should go out throughout your proce the process of building an age-friendly journey. But this is something you need to do to be able to identify both the successes and the challenges, and also to make decisions. You want to collect evidence on the impact your work has had on local people's lives, as well as how things have gone and what got in the way so you can improve things in the future. Now, this is the final stage in the cycle, but it should be something you're thinking about throughout. It's also, however, a key part of showing that it was a worthwhile investment. Now, throughout this period, you'd have likely seen political leaders change, and so you'll have new people to persuade throughout. So having built in evaluation and evidence of what's changing, that's how you bring on the next group of people. So that was a real, it might not feel like a quick view to you all, but uh, we have training in, um, for the network in the UK that goes on for several hours in each of those stages. But I just wanted to give you a quick overview because that, I think, that framework is the one that really underpins um, building an age-friendly city. However, as you may have experienced by listening to me, while the WHO framework is a fantastic template and you need to know it exists and also have an idea of what it involves, it is not an easy concept to get across. I am fairly positive that you won't remember the detail of my presentation on the four steps next week, even though you have these slides and you can go back to it in your own time. And I tell you something else, older people won't care about the process very much and politicians will lose interest halfway through your pitch. So you really need to, and this is my first top tip, is learn to condense your message and to bring it alive. So if you can come away, I was gonna say come away from this conference, but if you got to come away from the conference a couple of weeks ago with even a one-liner of what age-friendly is in your city or place, and an example of what it means to older people this will be a win. Ask yourself, what's your story? What will you achieve? What does it look like? What difference will it make? For example, in the outdoor spaces and building domain, there's a lot of detail and you heard some of that in the time in Copenhagen. But find ways to tell the story of what this domain means to people. This is what might people might say if it's successful. With that ramp up to the cafe and a new bench opposite the pond, I'm able to enjoy my regular visits to the local park. Make it real. Take time to build quotes and pictures and to express it in a way that makes sense for the people you're talking to. My second top tip. It may surprise you to find out that not everyone is going to be interested in this issue, age-friendly, as you are. As you start to understand the issues and understand a place and understand your place, you will be wanting to communicate what you're understanding and learning and bring new people on board. But it's really important first to find other people who understand and care. There will be some people who get it quickly. Start with them and build up from there. There are other people where you need to tell them why it matters to them and bring them in. Try to be that person who's in every place. The brilliance of age friendly work is that it covers a range of services and issues, not just about health and care. Um, Anna Barrett talks very well about being that person who's in every meeting, in every room, who says, what about older people? What about aging? But that's also what's hard about it too. You have an opportunity to be in all of those rooms asking those questions, but people in different sectors and services might not understand why it matters to them. So you need to be able to show why aging populations and the situation with older people matters and the importance of planning for that future. But you can often be surprised you can find allies in the most unexpected places. When it comes to building relationship, 
in this, as in all of your work, the WHO framework is your friend. Use it as a guide. Use it to think about who you need to involve and who you might be missing. Now, I've done this diagram that maps on top of the eight domains, all of the different groups and the different, organ the different sectors and people that might be involved or might need to be talking to and who might need to be on board, especially when it comes to action plans. So I would encourage you too to take this diagram and use it as a way to map your local stakeholders and who you need to be talking to and involving. In this diagram, and this is our logo that we use in the UK, we have older people at the centre of it all, and that's older people in all their diversity, because your work needs absolutely, most importantly, to involve the people affected. Their voices are often the most powerful, the most persuasive, and they will help you really understand what it is that you need to be doing and why. Now, this can be hard, but it's absolutely essential to the approach. Um, and it will always offer you new things, new insights, new perspectives, and also energy when the road feels long and hard, and it will. Um, then uh, talking to older people can re-energize you and give you new meaning and purpose. My third top tip, understand your city. And I mean really understanding, understand it. Be that person or that group who knows everything there is to know about aging and older people. Take time to build your knowledge and that of your team. Find out and talk about where are people aging in your city? How well are they aging? Where are the biggest issues? The biggest differences between parts of your city and other parts of the city or between your city and the rest of the country? An example of that is in Greater Manchester, their employment rate in the over 50 was below the national average. And they worked out that by increasing that employment rate by just 1%, they had an opportunity to improve the economy of that whole area and bring in an extra several million a year. In Leeds, their free travel passes were not being used by older people living in the poorest areas. So it helped them target those areas in a take up campaign. By involving older people, you can also see the city through their eyes and understand the city through stories, not just through data. So as I was saying, it's also important to get to the understanding of your place through older people's eyes and not just through data. Um, one way to do this is through um, a walk audit. That's a simple concept where you walk with a group of older people and other stakeholders to assess and report on the safety and walkability of a street or neighbourhood. It helps you understand the problems, but it's also a really good way to build relationships and find solutions. You're out and about with people looking around at the place. Now, these tools that are on the slide are from the USA and Ireland. And this photo is from a walk audit we did in Liverpool, where actually a local politician who also happened to be a wheelchair user came through the walk. So bringing politicians with you on that walk audit or as part of a focus group, along with other allies like disabilities groups, parents, families, other people, can also be a way to build the relationships that tip I was talking to you about earlier. Having said all of that, don't forget that a killer stat is a useful thing. Always have one up your sleeve, something that might surprise your boss, a politician or a stakeholder. This is one that, has, that is a stat that is true in the UK that we use a lot as the conversation around employment or other things can tend to drift towards school leavers. So people really, really understanding in one quote what the issue is, what we call a killer stat. And that neatly leads me on to my fourth tip, learn from others. Because the first thing to do when you start doing age-friendly work is to look around and see what other people are doing. And if they're doing something you like, steal it. And that's quoting Paul McGarry in Manchester, um, from whom several of us have stolen already, because there really is no such thing as theft in this movement. It is a really great place to learn from others and to adapt things to make sense in your own community. Because this is a global network, 
there are over 1500 communities taking this approach across the world um, which are members of that global network and there is some fantastic age-friendly practice already out there both in the UK in the Nordic network as we all heard about a couple of weeks ago as well as the whole global network and there's a database with a lot of great practices there is no need to reinvent the wheel the take a seat campaign is a great case study for what a community can do under the respect and social inclusion bane domain and it's a really strong example of learning from others. In, it's an initiative that Manchester took from New York, that Nottingham then took up and grew to 300 um, businesses. And it's taken off in a whole load of areas like Barnsley and other places in the UK. With Take a Seat, it's all about shops, businesses, any, any location really. But it's, it's about being aware that older people cannot walk quite often far enough there and back and they become isolated in their own homes. So local businesses, they can offer a seat. So older people, wherever they see the age-friendly Nottingham flower, they can go in, they'll get a seat for a few minutes, catch the breath, and then they'll be able to go on and do their business and then go back home. It's just um, more confidence that there will be somewhere to sit down when you're out and about, and that people are being made more aware that it is a significant issue. And uh, once people are made aware of it, they rarely seem to be in doubt that it's a good thing and they will always become helpful. It's just an awareness thing, largely. You know, everywhere they go, it's, it's in the shop, Nottingham Blue Society, everywhere you go, it's got Nottingham, take a seat, it's everywhere it's advertised. Every single social worker should know about it because it's about making sure, sharing, good practices. All it is, it's a simple concept, but I think it's the most easy one to implement. For us, it's important that all our customers of all ages are comfortable around the store and happy to shop and feel looked after. And we've noticed from time to time there were situations where we didn't have places for people to take a seat or just take a rest so they could have a moment and then continue with their day. And it's all about making sure your customers are comfortable in your store. So obviously it helps business. It makes people stay in the store longer because they feel more comfortable. So it works for both the um, customers and for the businesses. Councillors love it. The councillors are really keen on Take a Seat because it's working with their local communities. It's sustainable, it's cheap, and it gets people to think about what older people really want. So this brings me to my final top tip, which is have a plan, but be ready to change it. I've shown you early on a neat process. The WHO framework looks like it's something that starts at the beginning and ends at the end, but in reality, it will be like, very unlikely to be that way. You may need to start doing something before you have a plan, something that shows what, what age-friendly is, brings it alive, and what's something that can bring people on board and help you build those relationships. And it's something that you can learn from others and take from other places first. So the Take a Seat project is a really good example of that. Age-friendly benches is another. These are things that are visible and easy to understand, and they can create the energy you need to start interest. So you don't need to wait until the end to realize that's a good idea. There are also times when people just are not interested in your agenda, nationally or locally. So when that energy swings away from you, you need to find where that energy is and do something over there. Help bring an age-friendly lens onto priorities that people are talking about. For example, the carbon zero, zero or climate change um, agenda. We found that um, there is funding to make homes more carbon neutral by making sure they're heated efficiently or insulated well. Now, that's the thing that matters to older people, too, who are living in poor quality homes, who for whom heat and cold is a real issue on their health. So by sorting that problem out, you can actually help bring an age-friendly lens to the agenda.
It's also something, and this is where I went back to the understand your city, because when that energy does come back towards you, you need to be ready to jump on it. And we've all seen how quickly agendas and priorities can change. So don't sit around and do nothing, because if you understand your city and you have those relationships with older people, you will be able to recognise that opportunity when you see it. So that is the essence of my presentation. I just wanted to give you an introduction to the WHO framework, remind you that it is there to underpin all of your work. But my five tips are to turn that framework into something that matters and seems real to people, bring it alive. Completely continue to build relationships as you go. Always look for opportunities to bring people on board. Understanding your city, really becoming the person that knows, that knows your stuff will help you to do that. Learn from others, steal, 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 steal. And then after, after all that, have a plan, but be ready to ditch it if you need to. Thank you so much. And I'm so sorry I couldn't give this presentation at the time. I hope it was useful to you and I hope I will see you all in person. Please get in touch. My email is at the end of this presentation and will be sent out with, this, um, with these slides and recording. Um, I'd love to hear from you. We'd love to see you in person at some time. Thank you. My name is uh, Ken Jansson, for those of you who haven't, who haven't met me yet. I'm the coordinator of Age-Friendly Uppsala uh, in, uh, in Sweden. And this is the one I was supposed to use. Um, I would like to uh, talk about uh, 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 the Uppsala work for being a more age-friendly municipality and more age-friendly city. Uh, Uppsala joined the network uh, in uh, 2016, um, pretty early for a Swedish uh, city. Uh, we were the second one out uh, just after uh, Gothenburg. Um, and we started uh, with following the WHO uh, uh, manual for how you uh, go about uh, with this. Uh, so we started with the baseline assessment. So in 2016 and 17, we did the baseline assessment uh, in, in a form uh, of a, a quite big uh, citizen, uh, citizen dialogue uh, with the surveys, etc., with the uh, 60 plus uh, citizens in the Uppsala municipality. And we actually involved about 4% of all the 60-plus uh, uh, citizens in Uppsala in this work, discussing and uh, asking questions uh, about where we need to go to be, uh, become a more age-friendly municipality. Um, and uh, from this baseline assessment, we developed our action plan, and in Uppsala, it's in the form of a program and a action plan for age-friendly Uppsala. So the program for age-friendly Uppsala is a more of a strategic document with long-term and long-term uh, work and, and visions for this uh, work, while the action plan is more short-term and specific, uh, specific. Um, uh, responsibilities, etc. Who needs to do what in what context, uh, uh, in what time to to forward this work? Uh, and now I will uh, present to you a few examples. Uh, first, of how Uppsala is working with the physical infrastructure as the bearing uh, fundament for for age friendly practices, and then how we're working with the social environment which is the, the fluffy social and, and human uh, ingredient in, in the physical uh, world, so to speak. So here comes uh, four times two uh, ec uh, examples. A second. So four examples of how uh, Uppsala municipalities uh, municipality is working with uh, and for the physical environment to become more age-friendly. 
Uh, to the top left, we are working in different ways with H int integration, for H integration. The picture is from a planned new uh, school in Uppsala. We are in the middle of the playground uh, of the school grounds. There will be a meeting point for elderly um, 65 and older. Uh, so that uh, after school or during school, um, or during school there might be uh, an instance of, of uh, age uh, people meeting uh, each other um, between the ages. And also after school there's a possibility for the elderly to use the school facilities like rooms for playing music or um, physical education, etc. So, and, and also the, uh, the school grounds are um, developed to fit bo both uh, children during uh, school time and uh, uh, elderly or just regular persons, so to speak. Uh, top left, uh, top right is, is uh, a point about knowledge generation. We did a survey about uh, elderly people uh, in Uppsala and their preferences and needs in uh, housing. So this is now used uh, in further work to uh, develop different um, different aspects of uh, the housing market in Uppsala so it better uh, suits the aging population. Uh, to the bottom left, we are working with different innovation projects. And the one illustrated here is, is a... Um, is one pilot regarding um, a cooperative uh, living, uh, shared uh, living spaces. So by uh, living in a smaller apartment in, in a larger apartment where you share the, the spaces for the living room and the kitchen and the balcony, you could pay less, but you get a more social life uh, as we uh, talked about in some, uh, context yesterday. So we got this pilot and it from, from a more theoretical pilot, is this possible? How cheap can we make it? How social can we make it? What, what can we put in it? Uh, it is now actually uh, during next year, if everything goes right, it will be built in Uppsala. Left right is, uh, is discounts and fares in the, uh, and the senior friendly fares in the uh, public uh, transport in Uppsala. And this is a question that is not actually uh, a municipal question, but it's for Region Uppsala. It's another uh, level of the politics. So we need to cooperate closely there. And there are not, it's not only a smooth uh, discussion, but we are together uh, making uh, steps forward to, to make better and better uh, discounts, better fares for the elderly to, to be able to uh, move around in the city and uh, take part in different uh, activities and different uh, milieus. Um, so the, this um, physical environment needs to be filled with some meaningful content, content in social terms. So, for examples from how we are working with uh, and for the social environment in an age-friendly way. Upper left, Uppsala Summer Zone uh, was from the beginning a initiative for uh, kids and young people during the spring, uh, during summer break. Uh, so that there, there's a place in Uppsala where kids could actually gather and, and play sports and just hang out and do, do different activities and enjoy summer together, even if you you don't have the money to make uh, interesting travels and such. Uh, from uh, specifically this year, but uh, already uh, the year before, we have also tried to make it an age-friendly space. So it's now age-integrated uh, activities. Uh, and it was a great success this year with, with a lot of uh, elderly people showing up and uh, as the picture uh, illustrates, uh, people playing tennis together, uh, floorball, uh, more or less uh, um, adapted be because of age or, or functionality and such. 
So this is a great uh, area in the middle of Uppsala for uh, age-integrated activities during summertime. Uh, the upper right uh, illustration, uh, not, that best, not the best illustration, but it's supposed to illustrate senior lunches in the schools of Uppsala. Uh, since a couple of, of years, uh, most schools in Uppsala uh, serve senior lunches uh, and for, for the elderly in, in the city. Uh, it's the principal of each school who has the final say, is this possible in my school or is it not? But most schools actually uh, serve this today. So you could, if you want to, as a senior, you can show up at your uh, local school uh, at certain times and just uh, enjoy a meal uh, together with the, the kids in school uh, or with your friends or, or say hello to a, to a um, grandkid or something like that. So it's much, um, much uh, appreciated uh, and used all over uh, Uppsala, from the city to the more rural areas. Uh, bottom left um, is an illustration of a cooperation uh, between the municipality and civil society regarding activities for uh, the elderly. We have different forums, fora, um, together where we discuss with different uh, actors in civil society, what do we see, what do we um, know about uh, elderly, how they feel, what, what is sort of happening in society. Um, last, um, uh, last autumn, there was a, uh, a lot of, ex for example, the Red Cross and, and uh, uh, other, um, other actors in civil society told us that a lot of elderly do not feel very well uh, because of the war going on. Uh, there's an economic crisis. Uh, people are not eating as they should. There's a lot of stress uh, among many elderly uh, right now. Can we do something now? Uh, and, and do things now is not the, the, the what the municipality is uh, best at it usually takes like a year or two uh, but together we managed to in short time uh, actually compile a a list of activities that might um, be a support uh, during uh, the the winter time uh, last winter with different activities social activities um, possibilities to eat to uh, to discount price and in different ways uh, bolster or answer to this stress among uh, the elderly by social means, so to speak. So we, it's very important to cooperate between, uh, uh, to cooperate with, with uh, civil society. Uh, bottom right, uh, with inspiration not least from uh, Gothenburg, we had our first uh, walker race uh, this year. Uh, and it was aimed to uh, elder per elderly persons in nursing homes, uh, elderly people using walker walkers or uh, wheelchairs, uh, and it was um, it was uh, very. Uh, I think it was about something about fifty or hundred, more like a hundred uh, competitors, so to speak. But it wasn't really a competition, but it was in a. a sports um, center, activity center, as illustrated by, th by the picture. Um, people had decorated their, their walkers, and there was a prize for best decorated walker, so there was no, no need to run as fast as you can, but most decorated uh, walker. And there were possibilities on the side to try different um, sports that is uh, able to, that you're able to uh, managed with a walker or with a wheelchair like uh, bokia and shuffleboard etc and with, it was much much uh, appreciated and uh, there was also free ice cream etc so it, it was a great day and and it was also in cooperation with the civil society and, and sports associations uh, and afterwards we we got to know that from the nursing homes they said that oh you need to do this yearly because to us, it was like one or two weeks before this, we had 
all the focus on this and we were decorating and, and making stuff uh, to, to decorate our walkers and it had been like instead of just one day it was two days uh, two weeks of, of preparation for them and also uh, what we're aiming for is for people even in nursing homes to maybe find a new sport why not uh, to find something that's not only this great day but something that that lives on and that might be 10 minutes perhaps or more thank you so much Thank you so much, Kenny, and I'm so happy to hear that we have inspired you uh, in Gothenburg with our walker race, and you inspire me and us so much with your senior lunches at school, so I think that I will definitely take that home. Uh, my name is Emma Matson, and I am the development manager for Age Friendly Gothenburg in Sweden. And in the next 10 minutes, you will get to know our future developers and visit our chatty benches. But first, I would like to tell you a little bit about Gothenburg. So Gothenburg is the second largest city in Sweden with about 600,000 uh, inhabitants. And it's a city right by the ocean with a thriving harbor and a business community. And it's a city that has really always been open to the world. So among the people living in Gothenburg, about 20% of them are 60 years or older. And we feel really fortunate that our politicians have made the smart decision for Gothenburg to be an age-friendly city. And we have, like Kenny said, been members of this global network since 2016. And we are currently working with our first action plan for the work, which was decided on in the city council in 2021. So we are working together now with the several different departments, administrations and municipality companies on 16 different activities in this action plan. And of course we do this together with senior citizens in, in Gothenburg because that is what the age-friendly work is all about. To do it together as a city and together with the people also living in the city. Like I said, we work a lot together with the older people living in Gothenburg, and we do that in several different ways. For example, we have the Council of Pensioners, and we have physical meeting places for seniors all over the city. And we have recruited something that we call future developers, which I will tell you a little bit more about. So we have between 15 and 20 uh, future developers in Gothenburg and they are recruited especially for contributing to the age-friendly work. They live all over the city and contribute voluntarily to the work with their time, their skills, their engagement and commitment to help all of the departments and companies to, to move forward with this age-friendly work. And they participate in almost everything that we do, uh, from forming the actual action plan uh, to taking part in the work with the specific actions in the action plan. They also participate in various panel discussions and uh, in research projects and also in certain urban development projects. So we can see in the recent year or two that the interest in the city from the different departments and companies uh, is increasing for using these future developers. So right now we are also looking into recruiting more of them. And now you will actually get to meet two of them. So please meet Bo and Kerstin. Hi. You are future developers in the city of Gothenburg, Sweden, and contribute to the work for a more age-friendly Gothenburg. So who are you and why do you think it's important that we work together as a community on this? Well, I'm Boge Eriksson and I'm a senior citizen and I hope to contribute to a, an age-friendly city. 
my name is uh, Kerstin Ali, and uh, I think I can uh, give some uh, future things, um, thoughts about we must be more together over the ages. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. And what do you think is most important for us here right now in Gothenburg to to work on together? I think it's uh, <coughs> infrastructure, housing for elderly, public transportation, electricity, reliable electricity for us in the future. And what do you say? Yes, think? I want to build more bridges between people and uh, to make good places to meet each other. That's very important. And also a society that we have to use our body together with our minds and, and a lot more, more of green places to meet each other. Thanks a lot. You are very wise and me personally, I'm very happy that we get to work together on this. So now you have the possibility to send your greetings to other cities, countries and policymakers that also are in the transition to a more aging population. What would you like to say to them? Yes, I would say that you have to, we have to use each other and uh, to see us as not a, what you say, a homogeneous group. We are still a human being and we are very different, but together we can be very strong. Use our competence, perhaps? Yes. Thank you. Yes, I agree. I think in an aging world, uh, you must take advantage of senior citizens. Senior citizen is the future hope of the world. Mm. Senior citizens it's is the, the future, future to the world. Of the world. Yeah. Mm. Thanks a lot. That's a very important message. We will take that with us, all of us. Thanks a lot, Bo and Kerstin, for this interview and for all that you do to contribute to making Gothenburg an age-friendlier city. Thanks. Together. together. We do it together. We do it together. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Bye. They are great, actually. And here are three other fantastic future developers. This is Nahid, Ingela, and Håkan. And what you see here on the screen is pictures from a campaign that we recently had all over the city in Gothenburg on our big city information boards. We have about 300 uh, physical information boards in, Sweden, uh, in Gothenburg. Uh, so the future developers have been all over the city this way. This campaign is all about uh, digital inclusion and that we want to spread hope and the message about that there is help to get. So if you find it difficult with technology or digital questions, you can just go to the nearest library or meeting point for a senior. You don't even have to book a time, just go by there and we will try to help you out. So this is also an example of how we can work together with the future developers. And we have also made postcards from this campaign and sent home to people that are 80 years uh, in Gothenburg. And we also have free postcards with this same message in all of our libraries and in many different meeting places in Gothenburg. So you could just grab a card and send it to friends and family that you would think need it. And that was a little bit about the future developers. Uh, time to visit our chatty benches. Alana told you a little bit about this yesterday when she talked about social connection. And we, from this, with this activity, which is one of the activities also in the action plan that we work on, uh, we have got inspired by many other countries and cities, for example, by the UK and Northern Ireland, we, because they have also placed chatty benches around their cities. And so have many other cities done also. And these are our chatty benches. So we have 20 chatty benches placed all over Gothenburg 
in uh, places that seniors have identified as favorite spots. And we hope that they will stimulate social connection and spontaneous meetings between people and between generations. And you will now actually get to see them uh, come alive, we can say. Tyckte platser i Göteborg. Dessa kallas för pratbänkar och uppmanar till samtal mellan människor. Bänkarna är placerade på naturliga mötesplatser och finns i hela staden. Slottskogen. Kortedala torg. Positivparken. Förhoppningen är att pratbänken kan bidra till fler spontana möten mellan människor. Angered centrum. Sannegårdshamnen. Safirträdgården. Sätt dig ner och inled ett samtal. Använd gärna hashtag pratbänk och inspirera andra att slå sig ner på pratbänk. interesting also that when we do things around the chatty benches we tend to get in contact with people that we have difficulties reaching out to otherwise so what you see here on the screen is one example of that this is a campaign that we call dare to speak or dare to talk to each other and it's about mental health so we do this campaign together with various actors in society and not only within the municipality um, so we are then out around the benches trying to give people hope about that there is help to get. If you struggle, you're not alone. And this is also a great way for us to inform people about also what the municipality actually can offer to strengthen your uh, mental health and your physical health. So we have a lot of people giving us comments as those that you see here on the screen. Like, for example, we need more places like this in the city where you can talk to, talk about important topics like mental health and well-being. Or it's good to be able to get information about the city's activities and meeting places. I had no idea about everything on offer. So this is an activity that also brings people and generations together because we meet uh, as many older people as younger people uh, when we are out and about uh, the benches. I would say that the engagement in Gothenburg um, about the chatty benches is really strong and when we publish something on the city's Facebook uh, account we can see that these posts about the chatty benches are those that get the most likes and the most comments. And most people want more of them. They want us to develop them further. They want to bring them to, sp to different events so people can have like more spontaneous meetings also when we are doing other things. Uh, so we uh, decided this summer to invite people in Gothenburg to think together with us about how we can develop them further. So we had this event where we uh, talked about what we can do more with the chatty benches. We built prototypes and we made sketches together, younger people and older people, people living in Gothenburg, visiting Gothenburg and people also working in Gothenburg. Uh, and the ideas that people came up with were brilliant and fantastic. And now it's really up to us to try to do something with this and to convince our politicians and policymakers that we also need to now take this even further. Uh, and just a couple of examples of ideas that came up were um, like self-communicating benches or benches that had solar cell panels on them so you could recharge your phone or play music together. 
uh, benches with wider armrests so you can play games together on the chair, more color on them, uh, for example. And uh, a lot of people also want heat, heating where you sit on the bench or like rooftop shelter for rain and uh, windshield. So those are a few examples. And at last, my friends and colleagues, we would like to invite all of you to Gothenburg in August next uh, year, because then we have the big arrangement of the World Masters Athletics taking place in Gothenburg. And we think that is such a great opportunity to raise issues about aging and health, and over a hundred different countries will participate in this. So the warmest of welcome to all of you to Gothenburg from all of us in Gothenburg. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, I'm Thorhildur from the city of Reykjavik in Iceland. And I have to start to say that this is just like coming to a big family gathering as we have in Iceland. I've never been in a, on a conference where people are shaking hands and presenting each other when they go through the door. Right from the beginning, this has been just a great, uh, great father, uh, family union coming here. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, social connection and civic participation in Reykjavik. Uh, this is something uh, we have been uh, we have been in the in the network from since 2015, uh, and uh, have a have a big action plan which we have been uh, executing for the last years, and we are now in the process of a kind of deciding how we would, would like to structure the, uh, the work with uh, age-friendly cities. I, we will talk about it later, but now I would like to tell you about uh, uh, a district in Reykjavik. We have uh, 187,000 people living on the island and 140,000 are living in Reykjavik. And we have, in the different districts, we have uh, big outdoor swimming facilities, and these are the pubs for the older people. They go there in the morning, somebody go there in the uh, in lunchtime and in the afternoon and late in the evening. And when we had COVID, this was the biggest challenge because we had to, to shut down the swimming pools and because it's so important place for them to, to meet. So, um, uh, in uh, I, I'm not going to talk about the swimming pools, although I like them very much. But uh, in Grauvogur, uh, there are, are quite many older people living, and uh, and in '98, uh, uh, we from the city did send out letters to all the people 67 years old, and ask them to come to a meeting to decide and find out how they would like to organize themselves uh, in social activities. And there were 23 people meeting up, and 10 of them became the founders of this organization called uh, Korpulvar. Today, there are 1,200 members. I'm one of them, because you only have to be 60 years old to, to be part of the organization. And it's, it's, um, they have board, they have a different kind of, com uh, different kind of uh, committees, and the, it doesn't cost anything. Everything done in the, in the social activity center is voluntarily. And the only thing the city does is to provide the house, the facilities, and the, they get um, one person who is helping out, helping the older people to do what they need to do. And uh, she's a kindergarten teacher, and they told me that uh, that's very important for them because she's so 
she's not doing anything for them. She's just helping out when, when they decide what to do. And the biggest event in this, um, in this organization is the meetings. They are once a month and the house is just full of people. So they are very active and they, 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 this organization is special because it's all about social connection. So when people show up and want to be part of it, they don't say, what can the city do for me? They say, what can I, I can do this and this for this organization, for us. So this is quite, uh, quite uh, unique, I think. And, and, and no, what happened now? Yeah, okay, okay. Uh, they, the, the house is called Borgir, and they use the, the phrase Borgir where Joy lives. And I have to admit that that's quite correct. They are very interested in everything which makes them happy, and they are very interested in, in health. And they have, uh, for instance, um, they have, uh, for instance, uh, walking groups, and they are very much occupied with that the, the, the group is so different. They have... Uh, group for the people who are going very fast, people who are go not going that fast, and they have group for people who are going very slowly. They are very proud. They call themselves the golden snails. And <laughs> somebody can't even go. And then they have, high, have, have a physiotherapist who is in the, in, just in the building, and she is taking care of the most vulnerable, most, most fragile, who are not able to go in every weather. And during the COVID uh, pandemic, they, this group was something I just closed my eyes because they kept on meeting and they just took their walk and they said, told us that this is okay, we will take care, we will not go, go s very closely together and we will use masks. And they are kind of, this is their way of, of uh, exercising and making the social connections. Uh, I did a kind of a bottom-up research on how they, what is the, what is the way of doing it. So uh, they told me that uh, if you're going to make social connection, you have to give people real opportunities to influence. That was the core thing. And when they have real opportunities to influence, because if you want to be a part of this organization, you can just take part, you can just create what you want to do and you, you, there's no limits, there's no, you, you can do whatever you want to do. And when you have the respons responsibility, they go out and are of, of course active in what they are doing and they spread the word. It's not like something is coming from the city, do, you can do this and this, it is just th they themselves. If I, for instance, wanted to make a, a sw um, sea swimming group, I would go around and tell them, oh, come and swim. We are going to meet on, on, on Thursday, 8 o'clock or something, you know. So this is how things are going around. And by doing this, they make this social connection we are aiming for. So um, there's some, a lot of things which we maybe don't see in this kind of community. It's the way they are helping each other, the way they are, the choir, for instance, they meet up at the funerals because people pass away, and they meet up at the funerals and they sing their favorite song. Uh, some of the, a lot of the people are very skilled, as you know, and the lady in, uh, from the city, she told me that one day she met up there uh, at work, and there was a lot of flowers planted outside that was two brothers who are gardeners. They just found out, oh, we, will, we would like to have some flowers there. And they just did it. So this is kind of, um, if, if somebody is not meeting up, they check on them. Okay, this guy, he hasn't been here for, for a week. What's going on? And they take the telephone and they just phone and check. Oh, he's at the hospital. And then they can go and tell each other. And they, a lot of them are coming to lunches, lunches at 12 o'clock and the lunch, the food is coming from the city, but they decide how many and, and how they are going to do it. Uh, what? 
coming? Yes. But this is, this is not uh, coming out from nowhere. In Reykjavik, we are uh, very occupied with democracy. And we have a democracy policy to increase the citizens' participation. And we have a human rights, innovation and democracy council. And we have a residence council. That's a council in the district, all different districts. And then we have a suggestion portal. I think that's great because if you see something in the city you want to make better, then you can just send in a, a note and you will be answered. And if it is possible to make the changes you want, it will be done. And we are having um, uh, people from the city going out to these activity centers in the city. They are 17 and Borgir is one among them. And uh, the employees are teaching the older people to use this suggestion portal. And the residence council, they are also have a lot to say of what is being done in the district. And, uh, but maybe the, the, the project that I think is the best one, and it's very good for older people to use. Yes, uh, that is my neighborhood. That's every other year, the, the my neighborhood goes out and asks people to have come with ideas of what to do in the district. And uh, there's a lot of lot of suggestion coming in, a lot of I good ideas. And the older people, in, like in Borki, they use this. They want to have something new, and they, they go into this uh, in my neighborhood project. And then the residence council, they are kind of find out what should we really vote for, because it's so many ideas coming in, and it's not all of the ideas that we can we can uh, do anything about. And then the, when, when the residence council has decided what uh, ideas should be uh, done, you can vote on them. And when you are voting on the website of the, of the city, you know how much money the, it costs. So you just vote and, and find out okay, I, I'm going to use so many millions on that thing and another millions on another thing, and then suddenly the money is, the money is uh, you've used all the money, so you can't vote for, for more. But we are in, by doing this, we are bringing the money to the people. And what is maybe our biggest challenge in the cities, I guess you all know, you were laughing here when it, Kenneth said it, that we have to maybe decide something and we can make it happen in two years. And that's not a good thing. We, if you are just eager to do something like the benches of Emma or, or whatever, the, the senior lunch and the cost so a little bit of money, you are not willing to wait for two years. But by doing this uh, through the project of my neighborhood, the money is, the, the money are there. You can just decide how to use it. So, Yeah, thank you. And then I, this is just an example of uh, a changing room for swi sea swimming in Gravavogur, uh, very close to the Borgir, where the, where the organization is. And this idea came uh, last time we had this uh, uh, voting. And it was, uh, this is just a place where you can go and take off your clothes. You can, you can uh, make use the shower and just jump into the cold, nice sea and swim a little bit. If you want to have a, a if you want to like to, to not go to the swimming pool that day. So this is what I have from Reykjavik for now. The 10 minutes are over. And thank you very good, good much for listening. Just a, a couple of quick comments. So the Walker Rally, Gothenburg actually came to visit Oslo and got inspired by Oslo. No, but it's just, <laughs> I had to say that. My Oslo colleagues will agree, some of them remember this. But it's about what a network can do. This is what we can do, we inspire each other. And then I also just wanna say about benches, which is one of my absolute favorite projects. We have in Norway, in Ålesund, where our offices are located, uh, warm benches heated benches. So residual heat from industry are put into the benches, the seats, 
and the back comforts. So come and visit and we'll show you some of these hot, heated benches. Okay, so in my practice that I would like to talk about today's Generation Games. Uh, it's a really fantastic event. Some Norwegian cities that are present here have already organized it, and maybe more of you will in the future. So where are we to point? Okay, this is easy. <laughs> So, um, Generation Games was started in the Netherlands in 2012, and since then, editions have been organized all over the world. It's about bringing generations together in physical activity, games, fun. The creativity that the organizers show is just fantastic. It's up to the organizations and clubs that you get with you in terms of what activities that you have. And it really is a place of diversity, inclusion, um, the event is usually very centrally located in a city or a municipality, uh, easily accessible by walking or public transport. Uh, municipalities, cities, together with volunteering organizations, are usually in charge, the project lead, and they put together a project group or a committee with other partners such as clubs, sports team, training centers, organizations, and local businesses. And it's about public health, really. It's about volunteering and it's about the local community, all these factors coming together and bringing generations together. So you don't have to be super fit to join, you can just be in any shape or form you are and it's about low threshold, a low hanging fruit. The teams have to have a minimum of two generations, preferably more, but at least two generations. And although we say it's a very friendly competition, people are incredibly competitive at all ages. So that's actually fun to see how that sparks the competitiveness in us. And we've seen that it's a very inclusive event because it's for free, centrally located. Um, people of all ages come. Uh, this year and also partly last, a lot of refugees would come and join. So it really is a great event, not only for all ages, but for a lot of different groups in society. In Norway, it started back in 2017. Oslo organized it the first time. Since then, uh, when the center was established in 2021, we set up a structure for different cities and communities who wanted to organize this. We managed to secure some funding for some equipment, some prizes. We set up a meeting series of support for our cities who wanted to do this. So we had counseling, we had marketing material, we had some prices, equipment, and seven, so 18 in 2022, but 37 this year. And uh, the ministry and the government were so enthusiastic about this that they actually put this as part of the new reform. So we're now hoping that in the years to come, even more communities will do this. So just to demonstrate um, what it can look like. So um, weather is our biggest obstacle, as you can imagine, uh, but they're not stopped by that. If it's raining, they'll still do it. Solnes, one of our major cities, organized um, Generation Games this year in pouring rain, and they still had over 500 people coming. So we can't be stopped by the weather, but that is the obstacle number one. Um, so we'll do the meetings and we'll create marketing material and we'll help the cities from start to finish in how they can do this. Uh, usually it's done on the weekend, but not always. Uh, usually it's about a four-hour four event, Many cities and communities do it in conjunction with other activities. If there's a festival or market day, something else happening, then there's a lot of people about and you have sort of a drop-in effect. It's often used, I'd say, as a <laughs> signal event. Um, you know, this is part of Age Friendly. You get people together. There's a lot of energy, enthusiasm. So we use it very much as, as part of the Age Friendly work. It's good marketing, and it's a good way to raise awareness of what you can do and build alliances and networks. And, no. <laughs> Technology is wonderful. So on, on the subject of marketing and communication, it really makes for great stories. So uh, we have uh, created media kits for the cities and communities, but we see that once we got started, local newspapers and national newspapers love this sort of event. So we have a lot of good examples of how this has been featured in local television, local radio, and local newspapers. And we do have a lovely film 
but it's a Norwegian. Not only is it in Norwegian, but they speak a very particular dialect. So I won't expose you to that because it's also not subtexted. But we have a little video that we use for social media that will still give you some images. Generasjonslekene, de setter fokus på det med samhold i mødre og generasjonene. Og det er at alle er en ressurs, uansett hvor gammel du er. Det er jo fantastisk hvis den unge generasjonen kan se litt gjerne hva mor og far lekte med, og ikke minst hva bestefarforeldrene lekte med av aktivitet ute. Og så blir det jo litt for meg som liker å være aktiv, og det å bare se foreldre og unge være ute og ha det gøy i lag og gjøre ting. Og så har vi generasjonslekene her på Rådhusplassen i byen, der vi har passert, vi nærmer oss 50 påmeldte lag i løpet av dagen så langt. Og dagen er jo ikke over enda. Er det en ting som både ungdommer og voksne oppgir som en av sine store utfordringer, så er det følelsen av ensomhet. Og det å kunne samle generasjoner på tvers til å gjøre noe moro sammen, det er vel kanskje et av de viktigste virkemidlene vi har for å forebygge ensomhet. Kontakt på tvers av generasjoner og kunnskap og kjennskap til hverandre. Ja, for den fører generasjonene til sammen, og jeg har aldri vært med på sånt med Alina og så det er veldig gøy. Jeg synes det gøyeste var diskgolf. Vet du hvorfor? Fordi det bare var gøy, jeg vet ikke hvorfor. Jeg er mest fornøyd med at det er masse folk som møter opp når det skjer litt ting på tvers av generasjoner. Jeg tror det er viktig at vi møtes på tvers av generasjoner. Det er viktig at vi møtes til litt fysisk aktivitet eller annen aktivitet i lag og litt på tvers. and good morning. My name is Anna-Marie Sopenlehtojokin, and maybe the longest name here in, in, in the room, I know. Uh, uh, I'm from the city of Turku and working there as a, a specialist advisor in health and uh, well-being unit in the city, city council. Uh, uh, I gave you two examples from, from as promoters to the health and well-being of the elderly people. There is two examples, uh, very practical ones, uh, plus 75 strength and balance, balance training groups and uh, the virtual concerts of the city orchestra. But first of all, one word about, <laughs> well, two words about uh, where, are, where are we from. 
We are the boldest and also the oldest city in Finland, and that's, that's why well, we are very proud of that. We have now over 200 inhabitants and almost uh, 40,000 elderly people here. And as you see, it's very nearby to Stockholm and Sweden, in, in the middle of the archipelago, very beautiful one. And, I, and uh, that's uh, where we are living, and that's where we are opera operating. But uh, a, little bit, a little bit more, we are first in Finland. Uh, Turku is the oldest city in Finland and one of the oldest also in the Nordic. Uh, the first written documents where, where Turku is mentioned is about 12,020, 12, 12, uh, yeah. yes, something like that. <laughs> <laughs> and we have also Turku Castle, as, can, as you can see, it was founded by the river of Aura since 1280s. But now the Turku is a very, very cultural and economical center of in its region. But now the examples. Ah, sorry. Now. Plus 75 strength and balanced training. We have uh, groups for that elderly people. The, in uh, these groups, intended for over 75, pe 75 years old people, physical activity and well-being is improved with the strength and balanced training at the gym. Uh, as the muscle strength improves, the ab ab ability to function improves and making area choices and outdoors uh, activities easier. And uh, during the group, we are trying to find them uh, further training place after, this, uh, after the group, where, where are they balancing. Uh, and stretch the, uh, is participant to, that they can maintain training after the group. The groups are free, free for charge and meet twice a week for eight weeks. And the instructor is a physiotherapist or another professional of the feet of physical well-being. And these groups are very popular. Uh, we have a queue there, people waiting that they want to go there because the, the benefits are so good. We have, uh, after the groups, we are making an SBBB test, short physical performance battery, when we are asking different kind of things that what, what the training is meaning to them. And 71% uh, of participants improved that the total score of the SBB test is pr improving. And the number is uh, people are uh, answering to the questionnaire. Uh, in particular, the muscle, muscle strength of the lower limbs improves almost 89% mm, improve, eh, sorry, 96% <laughs> improve the time getting up, standing and sitting down is getting easier. And the risk of uh, impaired mobility decreases. The number of these in high risk clearly decreases Increases and the number of those is no risk scores raised increasingly. And 85% uh, feel that their physical condition uh, has improved as a result of the training. And 77 feels that training uh, has had an, in, an, an effect of the coping ability to functional of everyday life. So the results are very good and uh, very, very, very bad. Uh, <laughs> yep. Okay, and the, uh, and the second uh, example is a virtual concert of the city orchestra. We have uh, Turku Philharmonic Orchestra, and they made, made makes uh, virtual concerts to to the to the sense of community. To, to, to create a sense of commun community, prevent loneliness, and increase everyday functional among customers. 
They were sitting in uh, assistant living units, housing services units, and associates' premises. The length of the concerts and the program can be easily customized according to audience. If you know, if you know that they, that you can know that the elderly people they are not. Um, uh, it's at the time timeline is so maybe short that they can concentrate these things, but uh, uh, the orchestra is uh, concerting virtually. But there is almost always a team includes in the in the in the in the housing living units or or services, and uh, there is a producer presenter which uh, leads the concert, and there is a technician and also musicians that they, that, that they it make feels like a real concert. Uh, I, <laughs> I don't show you <laughs> that's why a, 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 a video because I, kn I know what's happening if I try it. <laughs> but there is a link it, it, in Swedish, it's Mitli Bibliothek. There is all virtual concerts and lots of more things that uh, uh, our people can enjoy their virtual life in, uh, in uh, different kinds of units and homes. Thank you. Hello, thank you for the invitation. My name is uh, Katrine Hefte, and I'm a special advisor for the unit of aged in and independence in Bärdu municipality. I'm happy to be here and for the opportunity to share some of our experiences on co-production with all the people. But before I presentate our co-production activities, further add a short introduction to Badum. Is on place. Here we go. As you as you just saw in the photo, the surroundings are beautiful, and uh, although the sun doesn't always shine, the climate is mild for the average Norwegian standard. Bærum is located in the southeast of Norway and is one of the municipalities with a border to Oslo, the capital. The level of income and education is higher than the average municipality in our country, and the level, level on public health is high. For instance, 80% of the population gives the score to a high degree to the question on how they consider their own health and experience on thriving in the local environment. An age-friendly Bærum is one of the main goals and highest priorities for 23 and 24. And for the municipality as a whole, with uh, 130 thousand inhabitants, we expect an increase of the aging population over the age of 80 from approximately 6,100 to 14,700 in 2047. We certainly have the, had to get the action going. We are very happy to be a member of the Norwegian National Network on Age-Friendly Communities and thankful for that the uh, National Center is providing us professional support and competence. So Barham has um, a political goal on creating an age-friendly municipality by focusing on co-production with all the people, cross-sexual collaboration and sustainable development. Therefore, a strategic plan on the topic on all the people is in the making for following, following up to the cross-sexual issues and solutions. Our approach to age-friendly Bærum uh, is not defined as a project nor a program, but as a cross-sexual group working, working together with me as a coordinator. This June, we distributed a survey on age-friendly community with the question, what is important to you? 
The question is well known as pointing out the quality dimension by empowermenting the patient in healthcare situations. But the question has also a kind of universal empowerment dimension that makes it suitable, we think. By this survey, we wanted to address our selected topics inspired by the Norwegian Handbook, white friendly development, and we asked what is important to you regarding housing, transport, local environment, involvement and community participation, and we also asked about planning on aging. We wanted to reach as many as possible, and the distribution on the survey was quite broad. Both di uh, uh, digital distribution to our different council and panels of citizens and residents, welfare associations, voluntary organizations, of course announcements through websites and social media like Facebook, and we also distributed written forms through libraries and senior centers. We're glad we did that because it turns out that 20% uh, of more than 500 responses were handwritten forms, mainly from people over the age of 80. The survey had both questions on scale from not important to very important, but we also asked for additional comments. We received a huge amount <laughs> on additional comments and descriptions on views on aging, their life as an older person, and topics that matter to them. Some was very personal in their uh, description, and that's why we are not publishing the full responses on our websites. We had a really good moment when we read that some people even expressed, thank you for asking me. Mm. We need to do more of that, for sure. I will just uh, show you the link uh, added for you to explore later on if you want to, uh, to see the, the survey um, and the results. And we are now in the phase of further anal analysis and we will see how we can combine the different variables through the um, uh, survey system. For by using a certain kind of dashboard, we can filter the answers, for instance, the answer to the question, where do you live in the community, we can combine with the answers and response to local um, environment and qualities. So we can uh, specifically um, um, filter the, um, the results and comments, for example, uh, according lack of benches, outdoor lighting and so forth. We are also curious if, if uh, artificial intelligence can help us analyze and comment on inputs from the workshop. Very interesting to explore further on. With this new insight, we can tailor our effort and follow up the local requirements. I think the follow-up is very important to be noticeable and to the point. On some topics, we will consider having more co-production uh, and local local activities. We also have now experienced how the survey was met, and it's interesting to notice that 72% of the respondees were female, and 36% were younger people <laughs> under the age of 60. Maybe we need to focus more on the older men in our further <laughs> inquiry. Late August, after the survey was closed, Bærum Municipality invited to a citizen meeting. We also arranged the generation games at the same time. We just heard about that and saw some pictures, actually, from Bærum. And we had a stand on the yearly Bee Fest, the kind of a festival in the town every year with music and culture and free entertainment for people in every age. Quite a busy August in Bærum. The community center, we call it Kommuneborn, uh, is a brand new building, uh, mainly office building, um, but also with modern facilities, cafes, open spaces, and possibilities for citizens to meet together and to meet the municipality as well. Senior activities is very popular already. And this was one of the first events that took place in the new meeting point, Möteplassen, as we call it. And around 70 people made the trip to the event, which also marked the start of Bifesten, the town uh, festival. 
and we wanted to present the topics in various levels and ways. And we therefore had presentations, both from national and governmental level, the municipality level and the personal level. And we started out with the director of Aging and Independence, Liv Blomstockstad is her name. We wished everyone welcome and, um, and shared uh, the municipality's work in progress on the cross-sectorial -sector way. And we presented the results of the survey that has been carried out. Then we received a speech from uh, Ombedit uh, from the Center of Aid Friendly Norway uh, with, um, about the national uh, approach to age-friendly communities. And we also saw a short film for inspiration on planning a bit for the future. And finally, we had our own uh, um, chief of communication. She's called Lisa Bang. She told us about her plan for the retirement. And she gave the personal change of life by retirement a voice. And we are happy that she agreed to use some of her spare time to contribute as, as an ambassador in the further uh, work in our uh, municipality. The workshop uh, later on, um, everyone attending could, um, could join uh, the workshop and we uh, maintain the same approach, what is important to you and what is important in planning for your own age. And you can see here some of the typical answers. Uh, I don't think it's so very specific in, uh, in Bærum from uh, other countries and uh, and places, housing, central um, issue, to live close to shops and transport and cultural facilities as well, and the meaning of social network and uh, to build and, uh, and maintain is very important. And um, some also uh, mentioned uh, the need for sufficient financial resources as an important issue for planning on the future. Now to the future uh, process. We now have a good overview over the answers given through the survey, and the next step for us is to transcribe, I would call it, <laughs> the input and insight from the co-production into action towards an age-friendly community. And our plan now is to to make some assignments for the line organization formulated by the citizen voice. Um, we want to present these assignments for the, the group of uh, directors and leaders so that the line organization can take the responsibility for implementation. Uh, we think that the cross-sectoral group we have already established will have a role in generating more assignments through further co-production and at the same time offer, offer um, competence uh, to support the organization, the LION organization. So we will continue to search for new ways to co-produce with citizens and the next occasion is an open conference, Bærumskonferansen. And it's, uh, this year the conference is dedicated to the topic of age-friendly development in the community. The conference is in the making, but we already have confirmed that uh, among the contributors to the conference is a prior central bank governor, <laughs> a philosopher and a neuro neuroscientist, and the volunteering prize will be awarded. I think and hope many citizens in all ages will be interested in participating, and we expect the entrepreneurs and voluntary organization to join in as well. And if you're interested in more information, take a look at the link to our website or contact me. Oops, I think my time is up, but this photos, uh, <laughs> that's not easy. These photos summarize our all at once activities uh, over a few days in August uh, this year. And I think you can spot the energy is on. <laughs> Thank you for listening. <laughs> so great. I, I really 
hope that you guys have a really good discussion. And thank you so much again for the Nordic Welfare Center for bringing us here today to share our, our experiences, you know, between countries, between cities. And I think this is one of the reasons why the UN Decade of Healthy Aging, one of the key action areas is to not just for cities to exchange with one another, but to establish a national program within countries so that we can have more of this regularly. And I think that's one of the objectives of the Decade of Healthy Aging. And we hope that through this meeting, you can feel inspired that you want to meet in person within your national network and also internationally in the Nordic regions, because I think the Nordic regions, with the support of the UK, is the best region um, to be able to, <laughs> yes, right? <laughs> to have all these innovative practices. And so I'm so grateful to be here as you know, me leading this uh, program on aging and health. There are so many dis different issues that we are tackling, but an age-friendly environment is an ecosystem, a mechanism in which we can implement mental health, sexual reproductive health, as we heard earlier from our colleagues from Manchester, on digital health, uh, all kinds of topics, and so and age-friendly competencies. And I think more opportunity for us to exchange practices and learn from one another is truly great. So earlier this year, we uh, a couple of us went to Poland and Krakow, the city of Krakow, establishing, trying to meet with them to establish a national age-friendly cities and communities program in Poland. And the reason why um, it came very organically it, the reason why Poland decided to have a national program is because of the conflict in Ukraine that they are receiving a lot of uh, older refugees. And so the age-friendly cities and communities are really concerned because they want to support the older refugees and reaching out to us about what can we do better to support them. And so this started the discussion that, you know, why don't we have a national program where we can better support the cities and communities, but at the same time also support the local po Polish populations. So we were there, and there was there, um, Natalie was there, and a few other colleagues were there. And we also developed a video to explain why setting up a national program in Poland is so important. So, so this is the session for today, and then later on we will have a panel discussion from some examples of national programs where we can learn from one another, and hopefully you can also ask questions about how you can develop a national programs in your country. The world is getting older. Uh, the population in Poland is also getting older, and we are very conscious that it is a need to, to take actions. We need to hold on to some key things. I think we need to be more socially connected. We need to have financial resilience, and we need to move into later life. Um, with financial security, but also in good health. And age-friendly cities and communities can enable them to happen in multiple ways. We saw that networks, groups of older volunteers, they could reach out into the different communities in a way that national government just couldn't. When new situations arose, they could start to think about how they could connect to each other and do more with the resources that they have and target better. It makes this uh, famous saying, um, think uh, global and act local, it makes it real. There are 11 cities in Poland that are age-friendly cities, but we are very happy to let you know that Krakow will be joined actually today. They will receive their certificate. We myśleliśmy, że przecież osoby starsze to jest ogromny potencjał, to ogromne doświadczenie. My tutaj w Krakowie mamy dość dużo miejsc, gdzie możemy się razem spotykać. Są panie, które chodzą do domu opieki, tam na takie zajęcia, takie plastyczne. Seniorzy czytają bajki, seniorzy nagrywają ciekawe audycje w radio, seniorzy noszą obiady swoim niedołężnym kolegom. No i dzięki temu możemy się spotkać, możemy się poznać i tak dalej, bo to jest bardzo, bardzo ważne, żeby wyjść z domu. Cred că o comunitate prietenoasă vârstnicilor este o comunitate care oferă, în primul rând, posibilitate pentru vârstnici de a se implica în viața socială, economică și culturală a comunității. Permanent suntem în căutare de training-uri, seminare pentru vârstnici, pentru ca ei să se simtă util și necesare societății. Prin intermediul ONG-urilor, 
putem ca să facem mai multe activități în, cu scopul de a face o localitate rezilientă și cu suport, cu condiția de a susține vârstnicii și a, a implica în soluționarea problemelor existente din localitate. Older people in general volunteer and they rolled out so many programs, thousands of them across the country through the support of the age-friendly programs at local level at regional level, but also at national level. In the national network, we give each other energy, we give each other information, knowledge, and we create a common language as well. So, that, so there's a whole range of different ways that people can help us stay in good health, socially connected and financially secure as we get older. If we develop cities and communities that are more inclusive, um, more accessible, and together with older people, we then make sure that we can age in place, that we can be active and engage throughout the old age. So great. So the, uh, we have had a lot of conversations with our Polish colleague, and they're working very closely with the Ministry of Health and the Ministry of Social Affairs, but the national program is actually housed at a university where the university can also provide the resources to evaluate their national program. So that's coming up. And so we've also done some research on our own, and we know that cities that have the support of a national program tend to perform better. And even during the COVID, where national programs can also really support older persons. So I'm sure you are familiar with the WHO Global Network of Age-Friendly Cities and Communities, which just started uh, almost 20 years ago by Dr. Alexander Kalachi from WHO, and really just spark. You know, this one idea really sparked into a global movement. Today, 1,500 member cities across 51 countries. And you can learn more about the global network with the QR code, which I'm sure you're all very familiar with. And um, I'm sure you are very familiar with this as well, that you know, it's not just about one sector, not just about the health or one sector alone, it's working together across different sectors, across different disciplines that we can improve services for older persons and everyone in the community. So it does benefit everybody and it really helps address a broad number of issues, as we mentioned earlier about mental health, about digital health, social connections, address social inequalities and really build a more resilient communities for, for uh, in times of emergencies as well. So I am also sure everyone is familiar with this. This is our global database where we have over 700 concrete activities of what cities are doing. And this is really great you know, for us to go to this website, you just type by country or by specific topic, and then you can have a list of all the cities and the contact information and whether those programs has been evaluated, and this is a great source of information. And so we are also in the process of updating this website to uh, enable multiple languages. Currently it's in English, Spanish, and French, and we're trying to expand this so that we can better share this, um, you know, virtually where we, can, where we can share our best practices together. So let me bring back to this map. You know, the, the, the success behind a global network of age-friendly cities and communities are really the affiliate programs. And affiliate programs are national programs or sub-national programs or even international programs that supported the local countries, cities, to become more age-friendly. So within Europe, there are um, part of the UN decade of healthy aging, we're actually given a task from the United Nations to provide guidance to countries on how to establish national programs. And so earlier this year in March, we released this uh, national guide along with toolkits and disseminations toolkits and social media package about why it's so important to have a national program. And so this is available in English, but it will soon be available in um, it is already available in Polish, but it will soon be available in Russian. Uh, French will be available by the end of December, um, Arabic and the Russian language, and also Portuguese. We actually 
earlier this year, we had a summit on healthy aging in Lisbon, where we also had a national discussions where they also decided to have a national program. So we're in the process of translating that into the Portuguese language as well. Which, with that, we're also supporting um, Brazil's and other uh, Portuguese speaking countries. So I think this is a great start to have our panel discussion. And I'd like to invite our panelists, uh, Anne Barrett from Norway. And Natalie is not able to join us, but we will share a little bit about the, the UK experience from uh, Emma, from the Swedish experience, and, and, and uh, Thorhildur from Iceland. So please come. Um, you may know from your program that we also have another speaker from Slovenia, Anna Ramos, but she sent her regrets and she's not feeling well either, and so she's not able to join us uh, today. But her national program in Slovenia is also a research institute that we recently established. And so you can see that different national programs sometimes are run by national government, by NGOs, civil societies, by research institute, by local authorities as well. So we have a panel discussion. There will be two rounds. The first round is like, we'd like to hear from our panelists about their national programs and their local programs, how it is set up, the structure, and then we will have some discussion questions. And hopefully that you will also have your own questions about how to set up a national programs in your country. So perhaps to start with uh, Anne Barrett, could you share a little bit about the national program in Norway, which in many ways is an inspiration in the Nordic regions and around the world? So over to you. Thank you. And I promise this will be the last you hear of me now. You've had enough of me for two days. This will be my last intervention. But um, the age-friendly journey in Norway started with two cities joining the global network. So Oslo and Trondheim started. And we very much took this journey together then to talk about this, to lobby, to present in all sorts of different arenas. And it was picked up at national level. So the national network now is part of a government mandate given through national reforms for older people. The first reform was from 2018 to the end of this year. And it's followed by a new reform that was launched in June this year and will take effect from next year onwards. And the age-friendly agenda has been strengthened. We're very pleased about that. So we now have a national program for an age-friendly Norway 2030. So that makes you know, us more comfortable that we have a long-term vision and we have a few more years to be working on this. The national network is part of the portfolio of the National Centre for an Age-Friendly Norway and funded by the Ministry of Health. Uh, currently, we have 216 municipalities all over Norway as members of the network. We have the smallest municipality with 200 inhabitants up until the capital. So we have the whole range and we have from the whole country. What we do in this network is try and get together, share experiences, develop tools, handbooks. We have conferences, we have uh, webinars, and we have peer-to-peer -peer learning. So we do a lot of activities. Um, in many regions of the country, uh, we also have regional networks that have been established to sort of pick up on the topics that we do in the national network, but to enable to be working more locally. Uh, so these, both the regional and the national, go hand in hand and complement each other very well. So in addition to counselling, tools and activities, we also take part in research and development projects with the municipalities. It can be in the role of being in an advisory group, a reference group, or in any other capacity they need us. Uh, we have had, and will continue to focus on helping to embed age-friendly perspective in overall strategic plans. I think that's one of the most important things you can do. It's wonderful to develop separate action plans, don't get me wrong, absolutely. But in addition, it's also good if you try and embed it into the overall strategic plan of your city or your municipality, whether that is on your social development or spaces, have age friendly as a perspective. Try and help to embed that in the overall strategic plans. 
Furthermore, a lot of work and focus centers around engaging older people in development of local communities. And we use a lot of different methods. And I have to say, it's probably what I spend most of my time on. And this can be anything from workshops to interviews to walkability tests to big conferences. There are so many ways of doing this. Um, so besides anchoring or embedding the age-friendly in overall plans, developing co-production methods, we also try and focus on translating plans into action. So it's not enough to just have it in your plans, engaging older people. What does this lead to? We also try and make sure that this actually translates into concrete projects, whether that be age-friendly transport models, different housing models, outdoor areas and activities, or different um, initiatives, I'd say, across sectors. So we try and translate all this theory and the plans and the strategies into actual concrete uh, examples as well. Because I do think that's so important. If we invite older people in to have their say, we also need to show them that we've taken it on board and something actually happens. While at the same time managing these expectations, because we can't fulfill everything, but we can do something. So uh, in addition to working together with municipalities and cities, we also work with businesses and organizations because it's not enough only to get municipalities on board. We need to get the businesses and organizations as well. And uh, Yongji sort of asked me a little bit about what I think, um, what I would consider a success. Um, I think it's fantastic that so many municipalities have joined. Um, of course, you know, their level of commitment is different, but they've all made an effort to join the network, uh, to have this as part of their plans and focus. So I think that's a fantastic achievement and I'm extremely happy about that. Um, I also take great uh, pleasure in knowing that a lot of citizen communities now have age-friendly in, both separate action plans, but in their overall strategic plans. And then, of course, it's wonderful to see the age-friendly practices, if it's benches or if it's age-friendly buses or activities. That's also part of the success, that you see the concrete projects. So I think that's it for me so far. It's great. Thank you so much. In many ways, this is the Nordic experience that really inspire many countries about you know, what can just start in a small number of municipalities to form together and become a national program. And now working very closely with uh, the Ministry of Health. Um, we hear uh, examples from Natalie uh, through the Center for Aging Better. So many resources has been developed, but at the same time, the UK ne National Network has developed very similar with the Norwegians uh, in, the 20, in 2012. And um, with a little bit of funding from Manchester, from the University of Manchester as well, with just five cities. And that came together to, right, five cities? <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, <laughs> five cities um, coming together to think about you know, how to better support all of the communities in the UK. And of course, UK is, uh, is made out of four countries as well. And now UK also have a national programs in Wales and, and um, soon in Scotland um, as Northern Ireland. <laughs> yes, yes, as well. So, you know, today what started off as five, and there are 70 cities and communities all sometimes run by local authorities, by volunteer organizations, by communities. And so you can see how it's being organized. And of course, Center for Aging Better is a nonprofit organization, it's a charity organization. And you can think about in your countries, you know, what would be the best way to structure arrangements about having this uh, national programs and how we WHO can support you and how we can create a network where we can share experiences you know, about setting up national programs. So the Secretariat, the Center for Aging Better is a secretariat that support uh, all of the cities, but it also helped to generate new ideas to test projects and to do evaluations, to do campaignings and developing a lot of advocacy tools that benefit all of the local cities and also benefit all of us because this is shared widely as well. So we also have our panelists, um, Emma and Theo Hider, who are interested to establish a national programs in Sweden. 
Could you tell us why it's so important for Sweden to have this national program in place? Well, I would say that Sweden, just like many other countries, has several reasons for implementing a national program on age-friendly cities and communities. And first of all, it's about, of course, improving the quality of life for its aging population. And with this aging population, creating the best conditions for age-friendly environments is not only a moral issue, but it is also economically and socially sustainable, as it can lead to reduced costs for, for example, elderly care, health care and uh, community services. So this is also a way to make sure that we are able to keep provide for a high quality welfare in the Nordic region. So, and also I would say that the age-friendly approach is such a forward-looking approach that brings so many actors in society together and really benefits the whole of the society. And we in Gothenburg, we now see a strong need for us in Sweden also to level up here, just like Norway. And we are so, I know that many other cities also are really inspired by the way Norway work with this. So we, uh, we actually had the privilege uh, this spring in May to arrange a seminar in the Swedish parliament on this issue with the topic uh, age-friendly Sweden. And we did that together with the University of Gothenburg and together with other important and exciting actors in society, like the Swedish Association of Municipalities and Regions, SKR, and the National Board of Health and Welfare, Socialstyrelsen, uh, Eni, that is here, was uh, with us then. And we had also the National Board of Housing with us, Boverket. Uh, and we had age-friendly Uppsala and, of course, age-friendly Norway and Anna Beret with us. And we have also had the privilege of um, have an ongoing dialogue with the members of the parliament and the stakeholders that participated in this event. So we are now talking about how we can move forward as a country in Sweden on this. And we are just about to start up an unofficial collaboration space at the Swedish Association of Municipalities and Regions and there seems to be a wish for us to come back to the Swedish Parliament and to have one more seminar on this and to have more dialogues on how we can move forward as a country and I see that the WHO uh, really we would like you to be a part of that uh, so yes. we hope for that. We will be very delighted. Yes. Later on, I want to hear a little bit about, mm -hmm. you know, maybe some preparatory work behind the scene about then, you know, how many networks are there in in Sweden so that you can prepare this and present to the parliament. And I, I'll be mm -hmm. interested to hear a little bit more about the steps that you took. But maybe let's pass I the I can just to, say yeah. one more thing, because we have uh, raised um, the question and have asked actually the Swedish Association for Municipalities and Regions in Sweden to arrange a national conference on this theme so that we could meet all of the municipalities and all of the regions together and have a common conversation about this to see what the way forward for Sweden could look like in this. So we, we hope for that. So having a national conference where you bring the cities together perhaps is a really great way to generate this momentum and interest and also to get the high level support from the parliamentarians as well. Mm -hmm. So that's a really great example of a step that you can take in your, in your country. How about you, Thalhider, in Iceland? Uh, we have a, uh, it's, it's very nice to, it's a kind of going back uh, some years when I sit here now, because uh, we have been in this situation before that uh, uh, sitting in a, a Nordic conference and, and feeling, I feel very small now because Anna Berit is telling so huge uh, success in Norway and I would really like to be there. And, uh, but uh, in, in Reykjavik we have this uh, special situation that uh, we are uh, quite big as a, as a city or a, a municipality. And the, at the national level, there they, they are interest in doing this. So it would be very easy for me to go home and, and tell about what we are talking about here now and say, let's do it. You know, get inspired from the other countries that this is something which we have to do. 
But in Reykjavik, we have been part of the, of the network since 2015 and uh, started with this huge uh, meeting with all the different actors and made this uh, um, action plan. And the action plan was uh, carried uh, through the city council. And I forgot to tell you that the swimming pool, the access to swimming pool for all the people over the age of 67, that was the first thing the older people in Reykjavik wanted to, be, to do to make the city an age-friendly one. So I think we need to move to the national level, but I guess the, the, the way of doing it, the, the way of making the Iceland uh, to be age-friendly will always be the biggest city or municipality to lead the, the way. But, but just to, to be part of uh, the, uh, the international and the Nordic and Baltic societies, we would like to be on the national level as well. But I, I have been thinking just uh, while sitting here, and Annabel mentioned the business part, mm -hmm. why, why don't we, inspired also by the, the, the chairs in the shops, why don't we um, make an, uh, a label just like the Nordic uh, Swan uh, Echo label, mm. that that uh, um, business, uh, maybe shops and different places can uh, apply for to be age friendly. It is a very easy thing to do, and we have uh, we have done it before with uh, for the Swans uh, mm. uh, Echo label, and maybe we can do some other things than just focusing on the the mm. city level and. Uh, or, uh, in uh, Reykjavik, we, have, we are very much in contact with the uh, citizens, and we have been using the, the questionnaires from the, uh, the old-friendly, uh, age-friendly uh, questionnaires, and going out to the district regularly and talk to the older people there, what do you need in this district? So uh, this is a kind of practice, we will continue it, but it will be very easy to have a national, I'm sure, but <laughs> we, will, we will have to do the job, I know that. Mm -hmm. So this, it's not, th not something we hand over to the, to the state, but we will be in the front, the front runner, but we will do it anyway. Mm -hmm. So I'm very happy to be here, and I, this is always such an inspiration to be part of the network. It has given us so much opportunities for changes. Mm -hmm. Great. I mean, the one thing I got from what you're saying is that it is important to have the key stakeholder in place, working with uh, Reykjavik, which is the biggest cities, to, to, to garner this interest and also working not just with the traditional partners, but now with the businesses as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. So, M. Barrett, can you take us back in time when you were establishing this national programs? What are some of the challenges and hurdles that you went through and what are some of the lessons learned that you'd like to share? I think the main challenge has been and, and will remain um, getting the cross-sectoral collaboration um, because I think we're getting better and better at the engagement of older people. I think that's really, it's changed a lot since I started. It's now become um, very sophisticated methods and, and a lot of great engagement. But getting that cross-sectoral collaboration is, is, um, is a big challenge. And it's not because the different sectors don't understand that this is a big challenge, because they do. And, and getting them to the table to talk about it, to discuss, also not so hard. But then when we get to the stage where this has got to be part of the strategy, this has got to be part of the budget, um, and be put into action, ooh, then it gets a bit tricky. And then we sort of revert to our different silos and, oh, but this is our mandate and this is what we need to be doing. So that, that continues to, to be, I guess, one of the main or the, or the biggest challenges. But I have to say, one of the joys of working with the municipalities is seeing how fantastically creative they are. They really make the most out of more and more restricted budgets uh, and they implement and embed age-friendly into what they're already doing and a network is just as good as its members. It's the cities and communities that are the network um, and I think they're just doing 
really great jobs all over Norway to an inspiration for us and you know certainly inspiration internationally as well yeah. um, but I think we just need to to realize that getting all the sectors on board creates an ongoing conversation it needs reminding again and again that this great challenge and opportunity that's called the demographic change is not going to go away um, we have a very misleading word in Norwegian, eldrebølge. It's like an aging wave. Tsunami. Yeah, exactly. And it's, it's just very misleading. But the fact of the matter is we are getting older. It will increase. And sometimes I just don't think we haven't really understood it. We haven't really taken it on board. I actually think the only place in the world that really has understood this is Japan because they're there now. Um, so we sort of have it a little bit in front of us. So I think what's important is to, to keep engaging in conversation, keep getting the different sectors on board, because this will impact the society as a whole so much more than maybe we care to think about. That's great. Thank you. <laughs> of course, as you said, the national level is the reflections of local cities as well. Emma, you know, I mean, of course, we talk about age-friendly cities and communities at the national level and at the, at the local level. At the heart of age-friendly environment is working across different sectors. Can you share some specific examples about how you are working across different sectors? Yeah, we do that a lot in many different ways. I think that is one of our main priorities, actually. And there is so much to learn together in this process of working together. And that is perhaps the most important thing, uh, rather than the specific activities itself. But for example, this year, Gothenburg celebrated 400 years. So we had a huge festival in the city. And together with the Pensioners Council and together with 50 other actors in society, different organizations, the University of Gothenburg, uh, businesses and, and so on, we created like a sub festival that we called uh, Age Friendly Gothenburg, I think. The, no, Gothenburg Rich of Years, we called it. Uh, and we arranged together um, so interesting uh, research seminars. We arranged think tanks together with the people living in Gothenburg. We had huge cultural events and intergenerational events. And this was so popular and was really a success. So we can see the movement now in society and that so many actors also want to be a part of it. Um, so that is one example. That's great. How about you, so Hither, and then, you know, when we talk about great getting this momentum, how do you pitch this to your mayor? And then sometimes they said, you know, what is the impact? How do you sell age-friendly environment to, to the politicians and to then say, we want to have a national network? And they would say, what is the result? So how do you pitch that? <laughs> uh, it's, it's very, you know, it's, uh, the politicians, they are very uh, eager having policies about everything. So it's uh, to put things into a policy, they like it very much. And we have cross-sectoral uh, cross, uh, policies. So <clears throat> I think the, the, the way to go is to, to, what we have been doing until now is to have the age-friendly to be a part of the different policies in the in the in the uh, in the city, and uh, just like the public health policy, uh, we have a different uh, actions there, age friendly action, and the way to do it to to talk to the to make the age friendly to be national, it's only to talk to the right people. I, I, we are so lucky; we can do that. So it would be just to because I know the interest is there, and if we can just explain in a good way what is your role, what, what are we going to do, it will be very easy to, to, to make this happen. But it's, it's a kind of a, um, to talk to the, just to book a, a meeting with the, 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 the most important people in the, in the department, and uh, they go and talk to the minister. It's, we, are, we are lucky to be so small. Thank you. <laughs> you have a comment, and Baron? 
<clears throat> I just wanted to comment in terms of getting support from politicians because, of course, this is um, a challenge. Also, you might have started a program together with a certain coalition of politicians and then there's an election and everything changes. So you sort of, you know, the game Monopoly where you have to go back to start. And, I th and that is a challenge, but it's a great challenge. And one of the most important tools that you have is what we've been talking about for two days, engaging older people. Because if you have insight, fresh insight, and a lot of it, that's very hard for politicians not to care about. If then when they're newly elected or changes are being made, you can say, look, we've done a survey. We did a walkability. We had some workshops. This is what older people are concerned about in our city or our municipality. How would you like to do this? Age-friendly is one great approach of doing this. I tried this myself in Oslo because we went from one colour to another in politics and it worked. So look at engagement of older people as your most important tool and most important investment because politicians, you know, they are elected by the people. So if you have this insight, it's well worth investing all that time and effort into it. Thank you. That's a very good response. And of course, engaging older person is the bread and butter of age-friendly cities and communities. So before I pass the floor to all of you for questions, uh, I want to ask Emma a question. Knowing that different countries have different organizations, different setups, some national program is run by Ministry of Health, some by NGOs and civil society, have you thought for Sweden, who would be taking the lead as a secretariat for Sweden? Hmm, that's a good question. Uh, we could uh, think more freely and do like uh, the UK, I think. That could be something, uh, kind of an age-friendly hub. Uh, and we, it could also be, I think, the Swedish Association of Municipalities and Regions, because they really attract a lot of different actors in society. So I think they could be good uh, partners in this also. Great. Mm -hmm. I mean, when we were, if I can share a little bit and before coming to the audience with, uh, with the Polish experience, we've actually done some background work before convening this uh, national meetings where we did the mapping of all of the NGOs interested on aging, talked to various level of governments and sort of see, you know, who are the actors who are very active. And then as we go along, you know, we recognize that there may be some tensions on some territorial, like this is my mandate, this is my work, and we don't want to work together. And then we find some neutral grounds. And so a university step up. And so then they say, you know, maybe this is a safe space with the university is sort of like, you know, on the level of ground. And they bring different sectors together to have this discussion. And based on that discussion, there was a, there was sort of a, a, um, an idea that perhaps the university could take the lead for now. And so I think the conversation sort of just evolved from there, but it requires some background work, some assessments and looking at the mapping of the, of the stakeholders and, and whatnot so that we can have an informed decisions. And when we approach to the members and we approach to the government about you know, what could potentially work. So the floor is open. And I know that you know it's not just the Nordic countries, but we also have representations from the Baltic countries and also very keen to hear from you about your experience uh, this last two days and your thoughts about creating a national programs. As we heard, you know, you don't need to have a big number of cities. You can start with just two cities coming together, sharing resources and supporting one another. Any questions? And we can take a few. Yes, go ahead. Hello, I'm Mari from Oslo, one of the districts in Oslo. Uh, thank you very much for the panel debate. And uh, Emma from Gothenburg, um, thank you for your presentation uh, earlier. Uh, I get um, the impression that you do a lot in Gothenburg. Uh, and I get curious in, uh, about how are you organized and how um, do you succeed with the work of age-friendly uh, measures? Thank you. So the question is, is about how do you organize together the resources, but maybe I'll just grab a few questions if there are others. 
Don't be shy. I mean, uh, it's the last day. Yes, Kenny? Uh, and this is not um, formulated yet in my head, but something like this uh, from the uh, talk uh, on, in, on this, at this table uh, just before the panel. Um, we were talking about this uh, organizational aspect, but also some kind of o overarching cultural uh, thought aspect uh, overarching the organiz organizational <laughs> aspect um, from the Baltics as post-Soviet uh, states. Um, you, you said you had the experience of, of, of going from a more hierarchical society to, to actually engaging and thinking about diversity in a sense. And I would say from a S Swedish perspective and uh, Sweden during the 20th century has been very much uh, um, about um, engineering, engineering thinking, modern thinking, uh, from the presentation yesterday, Dominic's presentation that, okay, so elderly should be here, and it's, this is rational if the kids are here, and we should arrange our society like this, uh, both spatially and organizationally. So I believe, right now, I believe, I would say, Sweden has some sort of identity crisis, but Sweden and perhaps other countries, uh, I believe, need to work more with the thought aspect, with the cultural aspect, what, are, what, what is a society, what are elderly, um, because when we change and when we go forward in, in that area, we would, I believe, uh, uh, organize differently and arrange our thoughts and our practices differently. Uh, so I, I think that's <laughs> somewhat related to your question. So perhaps you could reflect on that as well. I don't think we talk much about how to change uh, cultures, how to change ways of thinking uh, about society. Thanks. Absolutely, a cultural shift of that rather than competing from one another against generations that we can come together. Any other comments? Yes. Um, in, in my region, we work a lot with quality improvement and we have a, we always got the question, how do we know that the change is an improvement? Every, every improvement is change, but not every change is an improvement. So how do we have any measurement system in place that we can just copy and try to, because we are struggling a lot. We have lots of measurements in the age, uh, aging with, where, where the healthcare is, you know, how readmissions and that kind of hospital measures. So I want to, I want to understand how we can evaluate or measure improvement in, in uh, in this area, in more areas. Uh, so that's my question. Great, thank you. So we have three great, excellent questions and maybe I'll come to each one of you to share and perhaps how the national programs can s support that. Maybe start with you and Barrett. Um, okay, um, let me just first start with Kenny's reflections because I think those are really good. And it's something that I've been thinking as well that we sort of we need to learn how to be a society again, because along the way of being more and more individualized and becoming more and more selfish, we kind of forgot how to, to operate as, as a society. So I think that's incredibly important. We need to sort of rethink and reinvent ourselves a little bit. And I think it was quite scary to see Alana's presentation yesterday on how much social connections impact our health. It's extraordinary. So, uh, so I think we sort of need to reinvent ourselves a little bit again, create spaces for being together across generations, helping each other as a matter of course, not just being so individualized. So that just a brief comment on that. In terms of evaluation and measurement, yes. I was hoping that question wouldn't come up, to be honest. Um, but here goes. Um, it's difficult because a lot of age-friendly measures um, and things that we put in place, projects that we put in place, are not always so easy to, to measure. It's about participation, though. If you, put, um, if you create more outdoor spaces that are more accessible, they will be used more. But you need to monitor that then, and who's going to do that and who's going to fund it. You can see more participation. You can perhaps document some of it. That's one way. Or activities, or tr use of transport. There are uh, ways of measuring this. We haven't done 
so much so far. That is sort of our weakness. To our defense, the Center for Nature Friendly Noir was started in 2021. So I think our focus has very much been on, you know, establishing ourselves as a center, reestablishing the network, all our different activities. But it is definitely on the list. And WHO has some excellent uh, materials to evaluate and measure, and we'll try and translate this into Norwegian and make it available for the network. That is something that a national network can do. So we can make it available, um, we can help them apply these different measurements. But it is, so far, has not been our focus, but something that we need to, to improve. I just have to be that honest. It's been more about starting, getting us up and running and getting activities going. Also, keep in mind that although some cities have been involved in age friendly a long time, things and people change all the time. So you need to keep on working on information and communication, what this is, why we should be doing it. So that's an ongoing work as well. But yes, definitely we can measure more and more of the impact of the activities that we put in place. Any reflections, cultural shift, perhaps? Yeah. And how you organize it? I th yeah, and how we organize it. So yeah. cultural shift and how we organize it, that we try to reflect on and how, answer. How big is your team? Um, it's only me that work full time with this. Uh, and then there are so many uh, colleagues that work in the different departments and ad administrations. But there is no separate budget or funding for this work. So all of the departments are expected to do this within their ordinary budget. Um, so that is also actually a way of making it more natural to think in uh, friendly, age friendly. Mm. Mm -hmm. So that is one thing. And I, I think that you said, Anne Berit, that we need to communicate a lot. I mean, we need to be aware that it takes a lot to change established ways of thinking and working around aging. Uh, and the widespread ageism in society against older people also makes it a little bit more difficult to come across with a message. So if we can work together on this, also at the national level, we get so much more uh, strength and power to be able to change that way of thinking and working around aging and that could really benefit everyone and the way we work you asked about uh, how we work also a little bit more in Gothenburg to be able to make change uh, and that is that we focus a lot on communication uh, dialogues together with different partners and uh, together with politicians and of course together with senior citizens yeah, we do that and we also focus a lot on facilitate collaboration. That is a big part, to get the different stakeholders together and to be able to meet and talk about these uh, important issues. But I, uh, this is a tip for all of you. Uh, when I started working with these questions two years ago, I had the privilege of going, uh, of doing the mentorship program, the ECHO mentorship program. Um, that the WHO offers and that was a great start for me and the recommendations is really there to be bold just do it and uh, try to walk in each other's shoes and be curious and remember that you don't have to have everything in place to get started just do it and when you get stuck also remember that no one can do this alone so don't ever hesitate to reach out a hand and ask for help and remember that you have so many colleagues i'm sure around locally where you work that are willing to help you and remember also that you have so many friends and colleagues within this age-friendly community that really wants to support your work also. Great, thank you so much. So Heather? Yes, I, I, I think also, just as Anna Berit said, uh, the, our biggest resource are the old people themselves and they are very active in, in Reykjavik. Uh, there's a, there has been a, a a lot of democ democracy working for, uh, be on behalf of the city. And we have a different way of uh, uh, talking to each other and, and, and practicing direct uh, democracy. And the, older, the council for older people, it's not only older people sitting in the council, it's al also uh, politicians. Mm -hmm. they, are, they are there and they, some of them are, are and they are, they are very pushy, you know. 
they they don't let you just sleep and do mm -hmm. don't do anything. So they will be a, a, a great, they are a great factor in 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 everything. But this is a kind of a part of the being age friendly is also a kind of uh, a way of thinking and way of thinking in the all the processes we are in, and we have been focusing quite a lot on on public health and. I have been thinking about if, why don't we just have the older people in the public health uh, strategy? We have a part, you know, a part of it. But at the same time, if we just have older people there and we are not uh, focusing on them specially, they will be forgotten. We know that. So we every every time we are talking about the Reykjavik as a city, we say Reykjavik uh, an age-friendly and healthy city. And this is a kind of a, a way of uh, doing something, mm. and and but we have to be much more reaching out in society, talking about older people as a resource, and talking about getting old is nothing to to be afraid of, mm. and also that that it, it's it's not um, age friendly is is for every everybody. And I don't know really why we are just focusing on older people. We should focus on every young people too. And as I told you in, in, in my presentation, the, the kindergarten teacher, she is a very, very valuable employee because she is using the same methods there as she has learned how to do in the kindergarten. And, and it's, it's very, very good to take an aspect of working and move it to another group. So I think we should just continue to 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 address the thing we have have to do and uh, and and do it together with the older people. They are the they are the they and we and together with different yes, generations, yes. as you said. Age friendly yes. environment is not just for older persons, no. but for all of us. Mm -hmm. I see that there's one last question from the floor and one final comment from Emma, and then we'll we'll close for our closing. So, Helena. Okay, I just want to uh, comment on Emma. I'm colleague with Emma from Gothenburg, and, and my mission is to empower politicians and decision makers and policy makers, and in collaboration with Emma and age friendly cities and communities, um, I push for the human rights of older persons, which cover, covers many areas of age friendly cities. And I just want to tell you all that age friendly cities and communities are. Um, changing the narrative. So we should be, um, even if we have a lot of challenges, we should be positive. In, I mean, I can see this happening in Gothenburg, but also when we went to the government and worked on that. Uh, because it's well known that the, politica, the politicians and the rhetorical has more of a healthcare perspective than citizen perspective uh, when it comes to aging. So uh, in comparison to other groups, we need to talk about age in place and, and just, you know, who gets older is none, none, I mean, I'm, I'm older. Everyone is aging. This is something for, that happens everyone, hopefully. I mean, the alternatives are <clears throat> something else. So I think that, that, that also we have all an important task and di on different levels. For me, it, it's uh, empower politicians, but the movement is together. And I think that's something I take from this two days, that we all have an important task on different levels. Uh, and an age-friendly Sweden is not solved alone. Uh, we have to do it together. It's about laws and regulations, policies and decision-making, capacity, methods, approaches, and evaluation and knowledge, you know. I can hear that we're all talking about all these different levels. So I just want to encourage and say thank you because, you know, we are shaping the narrative. And, and thank you. So I just want to say I'm that. Sorry. So it was not a question. It was more like, hooray, this is great. <laughs> And, final and I get to comment on that. <laughs> Thank you a lot, Helena, for, for um, um, giving this compliment to this discussion. Uh, fantastic. I'm so happy also that I get to work with you. Thank you. Uh, I would just like to, um, to tell you about, perhaps you don't know this, all of you, but uh, talking about the, how you can follow up on the work uh, that the Nordic Welfare Center have made two reports on uh, which indicators you can use and, and what the WHO also recommends. So, so read those. They are on the web uh, for the Nordic Welfare Center. I would also like to, to inform you about that the uh, OECD, 
uh, has a way of measuring well-being. So that could also be interesting for different regions and cities to look into. How do you measure well-being in a city? And that is, of course, for all ages. So that was a final tip. But apart from that, so just do it. Try something, involve people, and keep talking about age-friendly environments and cities and communities. Great, thank you so much with that, thank you. I just wanted to say that we, as WHO, we are here for you. We work with you. We work with across generations. And as mentioned, we have some publications about indicators and measures. And we're also having those examples about what, how it's being measured at cities and country level. Happy to share that with everybody. We also have this mentorship program. So if you're interested, of course, we can arrange mentorship programs between cities, between countries, and between regions. And we also have WHO collaborating centers where we work closely with universities and to, so that we can actually come together, share the data, we can f actually do it together to evaluate a program so we can share with other, uh, with other people as well. And so it's meeting like this that we can really exchange knowledge, come together and be inspired. And so really thank you to the Nordic Welfare for having this meeting here. And for WHO, we are very committed to have regular meeting like this as well. And I think we uh, have some initial preliminary discussions with Manchester to, in next year, to have similar meeting like this, where we can invite cities and communities and country programs to come and share experiences and to have workshop like this. And so with that, I'd like to invite uh, uh, Dr. Eva Friesen, director for the Nordic Welfare Centers, to give us some closing remarks. How could I make those closing remarks to this marvelous <laughs> conference? But I tried, and I have prepared some words. Well, uh, this gathering was centered around building an age-friendly cities. And I had a priv uh, we have the privilege of engaging with Nordic cities that work very extensively, ambitiously, and with a long-term vision. Representatives from various sectors collaborate with the cities, and senior citizens actively participate in their development. We have learned about the success factors and the challenges faced. We have delved into current research and been inspired by numerous examples of best practices. Notably, we have been seen how elderly actively contribute to the develop cities and communities. Above all, we have had the opportunity to discuss and connect. During these days, we have all have the, emphasized the importance of building relationships, engaging in conversations, and bringing people together to develop shared vision of an age-friendly age society. We all at this conference come from different backgrounds, roles, and circumstances. Yet we are united by our strong commitment to create conditions conductive to good living and standards of quality for life for the elderly. And for the Nordic Welfare Center, it has been a pleasure to organize this conference in collaboration with the Nordic Network and WHO. The aim was to strengthen the Nordic Network of age-friendly cities. We hope that this conference and all the interaction and networking has invigorated our endeavor. Today, the Nordic Welfare Center coordinates the Nordic Networks for Age-Friendly Cities, which includes 12 Nordic cities in the global uh, WHO global network. This work is based on the mandate from the Nordic Council of Ministers and needs to renewal next year if we want to proceed. The motivation and engagement from the cities seems to be evident, uh, not at least in the light of this commitment you have shown these days. 
The network will be a crucial as aspect for cooperation concerning older adult. I'm sure it will be. The objective of the Nordic collaboration could be to back all the Nordic nation in establishing national coordination mechanism, or can what we see in Norway. This way, each country could have a coordination at the national level, making Nordic collaboration possibly even more structured. So to conclude, I will express my gratitude to everyone who contributed to make this uh, conference possible. First, I'd like to thank our moderator, Anne Beritrufos, who makes this as a perfect moderator. Thank you. <laughs> and of course, I also would like to extend my appreciation to the working group that prepared this conference, including Emma Matsron from Göteborg and Thorhildur Egelstarter from Reykjavik. Where are you? <laughs> yes. Mm. And besides Anne uh, Berit, of course. Also, a big thank to the staff, Victor and, and Lars at the Nordic Welfare Center, who in various ways have been involved in this conference. A big applause to them, too. <laughs> and a special thanks to WHO and John D. John for the collaboration. <laughs> And also thanks a lot to your colleagues, Olga and uh, Mary Loss, for all the support and help uh, it, for uh, all the practical things. <laughs> it has been a fruitful partnership, which I very hope will continue in the future. So with this, thank you very much. It has been wonderful to be here and to listen to all you. It's uh, uh, a lot of positive things. and. Uh, I, with this, I uh, will hand over for the absolutely la last thing to, to John Lee. Thank you. Thank you so much. You said all the thank yous, and what left for me is to thank all of you for your very active participation this last two days, and I hope that this is not the end of our conversations, that we will continue this. Um, I also want to say a few thank yous to the, um, the staff at the UN Cities for helping us this last two days. Um, you may have seen Henrik upstairs. He's been coming down, working behind the scene, and Sebastian, he is filming this two days, so which will be made available uh, to you and uh, to my colleagues at WHO headquarters, Elena, for coming yesterday. Um, and to the Healthy Cities Network who are supporting us behind the scene as well. And of course to my staff, um, Olga and Mary Alos for really working behind the scenes and short of cooking the Italian meals, they have really done everything to support all of us. So thank you so much, um, very much. And finally to thank uh, the Nordic Welfare Centers um, and Eva and Kai and Victor and Lars, so much for the great support and, and, and collaborations. And so the last thing is that um, we need your badge. <laughs> so um, that is very important. So please um, give us the badge. And um, Olga and Marialos is at the back, if you can give it to them. And because the, our security is here, so they will naturally open the, the gate for you when you, when you exit. Um, but before you exit, of course, we want to feed you. And so we have our lunch upstairs at the Atlantic Lounge. And so thank you so much. Have a really safe trip home. And uh, we will share all the photos with you. And we hope to see you again. Thank you. Thank you.